Welcome to another episode of the Molecular Cell Biology YouTube channel. In a previous episode, we mentioned how there are two main determinants that dictate the function of a protein within the cell. The first one is the shape of a protein. And the second one is the location of that particular protein. This second factor plays an absolutely key role in allowing proteins to achieve their final function within the cell. As for a protein to be able to provide whatever function it is meant to provide a cell with, it needs to be in the right intracellular location. For instance, transcription factors to be fully functional they have to be located in the cell nucleus. Similarly, proteins of the respiratory chain need to be located in the mitochondria. And finally, transporters, proteins involved in the uptake of molecules from the extracellular environment, need to be located in the plasma membrane. This need for proteins to be in the right cellular location to provide the right function to the cell brings along one of the most critical questions in molecular cell biology, and that is how are proteins targeted to the different organella in the cell? And the answer that has been obtained after extensive experimentation and research in this area indicate that just like the shape of a protein is directly dictated by its amino acid sequence, that is their primary structure, similarly, the location of a protein is also dictated by the amino acid sequence of a protein. And by the way, both of these properties, the shape and the localization of a protein, can both of them be modified by post-translation modifications. In other words, there are specific amino acid sequences that function as targeting signals that indicate where in the cell any given protein must be localized. And the reason for that is because those specific amino acid sequences that target proteins to different locations within the cell allow for proteins to interact with the right type of proteins that will allow them to then end up in the right location within the cell. For instance, for proteins that are destined to be located in the mitochondria, they must have a mitochondrial targeting signal, or MTS. Proteins that are destined to go to peroxisomes, then they must have peroxisome targeting signals, or PTS. And proteins that are targeted to go to the nucleus of the cell, they must contain nuclear localization signals. Interesting, some of these proteins also, once they reach the nucleus, they also need to be exported out of the nucleus. So some of those proteins also contain nuclear export sequences or nuclear export signals. Similarly, there are specific sequences that allow proteins to be targeted along what we define as the circuitry pathway, which is constituted by the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, circuitry vesicles, endosomes and lysosomes, as well as the plasma membrane. Notice, however, this pathway constitutes a different set of potential destinations separate from the ones that we had actually mentioned before. So the circuitry pathway constitutes kind of a separate set of potential destinations within the cells, and it has a single entry door. And that single entry door to the circuitry pathway is located in the endoplasmic reticulum. So all proteins that are to be targeted to any of these destinations along the circuitry pathway must enter this pathway through the endoplasmic reticulum. And this peculiarity defines the main two paths that proteins may actually follow within the cell. The first path is that followed by proteins that are synthesized in free-floating ribosomes meaning the protein is synthesized and fully released from ribosomes before being finally targeted to the different locations that the protein is meant to go within the cell. And this is the path that is followed by proteins that are meant to either remain in the cytoplasm or to go to the nucleus, the mitochondria, chloroplasts, or peroxisomes. So proteins destined to any of these locations are fully synthesized in free-floating ribosomes and are released away from the ribosome before they are destined to their final location within the cell. The second path is the one that is followed by proteins that are synthesized in ribosomes that are associated to membranes, specifically to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And proteins that are synthesized in ribosomes that are associated to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum are those that are destined to go to either the endoplasmic reticulum, that is remaining the endoplasmic reticulum, or to go to the Golgi apparatus, 
endosomes, lysosomes, secretory vesicles, the plasma membrane, or proteins that are destined to be secreted out of the cell, which, by the way, indicates that they are being secreted, they are being released out of the cell, which is what gives the name to this pathway as a whole, as the secretory pathway. And then the question becomes, what dictates whether a protein will be synthesized in free-floating ribosomes or in ribosomes that are associated to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum? What is the key determinant element that decides how proteins are going to be synthesized within the cell? Which path is going to be followed by any specific protein? And one thing that needs to be kept in mind is that the ribosomes that are synthesizing proteins either as free-floating ribosomes or as ribosomes that are associated to membranes, those ribosomes are exactly the same. Meaning there is no difference whatsoever in the constitution of ribosomes that do one or the other type of synthesis of proteins. They are exactly the same. So then the question again is, so what is the key element here? What is the key determinant if it is not the constitution of the ribosomes per se? And the answer is that proteins that are meant to be synthesized in ribosomes that become associated to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, that type of proteins contain a signal sequence, which is typically located at the end terminus of the protein. And a signal sequence is a core of 7 to 12 hydrophobic amino acids, which are located typically at the end terminus of the protein. And this signal sequence allows proteins to be targeted to the endoplasmic reticulum because it is recognized by a particle that is present in the cytosolic environment of the cell, a particle that is known as the signal recognition particle represented here. That signal recognition particle is made of two main components. One component is an RNA molecule, a short riboparticle RNA sequence, and six different polypeptides, six different proteins that associate with that sequence of RNA. Now, this signal recognition sequence recognizes the signal sequence, the moment that that signal sequence becomes exposed in the cytosolic environment of the cell. So the moment that that signal sequence becomes accessible outside the surface of the ribosome, the signal recognition particle interacts with, with it, recognizes the hydrophobic nature of that signal sequence, and that allows this particular end of the signal recognition particle to interact with it. And once that interaction is established, the other end of the signal recognition particle interacts with another side of the ribosome, which is a site that is typically involved in engaging the elongation factors. And this engagement of that region then keeps those elongation factors away, therefore producing an actual stop in the process of protein synthesis. So protein synthesis is paused by the binding of the signal recognition particle, and the next event is the binding of the signal recognition particle to the signal recognition particle receptor, which is an integral membrane protein of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is a receptor that is located in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And importantly, that receptor, the signal recognition particle receptor, is located right next to the translocum, which is an integral membrane protein of the endoplasmic reticulum as well, but this one has the peculiarity of forming an aqueous channel that allows the translocation of proteins through that channel. So, once the signal recognition particle has associated to a signal recognition particle receptor, the ribosome is then brought in close proximity to the translocum, and then it is placed in such a way so that the location through which the newly synthesized protein comes out of the ribosome is in direct juxtaposition to the aqueous channel of the translocum. So as the protein continues to be synthesized, it will be then pushed right through the aqueous channel of the translocum. Now, at this point, the signal recognition particle disengages from the two areas that it had actually been interacting with. So it lets go the signal sequence from the polypeptide that has been synthesized in the ribosome, and it also disengages from the area that outcompetes with the elongation factors. So at this stage, translation can continue, the ribosome can continue moving along the messenger RNA, therefore synthesizing proteins, and the protein that is being synthesized will continue to come out of the ribosome, but now as it comes out of the ribosome, 
it'll go directly into the channel of the translocon, and therefore it'll be translocated co-translationally through that translocon into the endoplasmic reticulum. So this process is referred as the co-translational translocation of proteins through the translocon. One event that typically happens after proteins continue to be translocated through the translocon is the elimination of the signal sequence that allowed proteins to be targeted to the translocon in the first place. So this elimination of the signal sequence is actually performed by a peptidase, a protein known as the signal peptidase because it cleaves off the signal peptide. And when that takes place, the protein that continues to be synthesized is then released as a soluble protein in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. The lumen is the space within the endoplasmic reticulum. So these proteins that are then released within the endoplasmic reticulum can then continue along the circuitry pathway to go to the different locations within the cell. So in summary, the big ideas of this brief video are, number one, the amino acid sequence of a protein is the main determinant that dictates where a given protein will be located within the cell. This can be modified by post-translational modifications. And there are two major locations within the cell. One of them is along the different membranes and organelles associated to the circuitry pathway, and another one is all other potential destinations within the cell. And depending upon which one of these big pathways a protein may actually need to go, proteins will be synthesized either in free-floating ribosomes or in ribosomes that are associated to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope that it helped you clarify the idea of how proteins are directed to different locations within the cell. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and thank you for watching.